My love of Germany and my fascination with Nazis may have the same origin point, but they've developed into two very different interests. I've always had a love of supervillains, and to this day, movies and shows that lack an antagonist of substance are not movies or shows that I watch. While reading about the two world wars in the encyclopedia my family owned, they certainly made Germany out to be a sort of supervillain of history, dragging the world into its deadliest wars and destroying the fashionable old order of colonialism and top hats while ushering in the era of nukes and terrorism. Of course, on closer examination, it's not that simple, and there were a wide array of factors that brought down European supremacy, something that was not as cut and dry as old books like to make it out to be. But my young self, being more interested in villains, took an immediate liking to this country, and I've been in love with it ever since. One thing I've always found captivating about villains is motive. How do they justify their actions to themselves and others? Just like most villains, Germans didn't see themselves as the villains, and for a long time they didn't even see themselves as Germans. They've gone through a fascinating parallel to the United States in many ways, culminating in the Second Reich, which functioned as a monarchical mirror to my federal home country, making my exploration all the more engaging. This video is not about Nazis. In fact, I'm going to end this with Hitler taking power because Germany's whole identity has been Nazified, something they've desperately tried to avoid and which is completely unfair to their history. I can't even have this iron cross up without people telling me it's a Nazi symbol, which is sad because, in a way, they're right. Hitler co-opted all of German history to justify his goals and people just believe it. They just buy into Hitler's idiotic propaganda about a country destined for the Holocaust. But today, we re-examine this nation without swastika-tinted glasses and look for actual answers rather than excuses dreamt up by a racist incel. The first thing I'm going to ask is that you forget what you know. Forget that this path leads to genocide and look with childlike wonder at the path before you and the possibilities it holds. Pretend the future is open, like it once was. The second thing is that I'm not making a five-hour video that covers the factual development of Central Europe in depth. I'm doing a 20-minute overview to sum up the course of Germanic development, so forgive my oversimplifying. We start our journey in the cold, damp forests north of civilization in a region known only to outsiders as Germania. This name, popularized by Tacitus, was put forward to describe the rural population living north of the Danube and east of the Rhine and contrast them with the urban world of the Romans. Tacitus presents them in his treaties as the prototypical noble savage, lacking the civilized customs of the Romans, but making up for it in their own sloppy, pants-wearing way. How much of his writings are accurate are a subject of much debate, and we can confidently say that the people in the region he was writing about had no say on the contents of his book or the name given to their peoples. They certainly didn't see themselves as a cohesive group. They were tribes, and I imagine the vast majority saw themselves in a tribal fashion, something that will survive into the 19th century in an updated format. These people to the north were not isolated from the Romans or their influence, and over time, several of these tribes converted to Christianity before even passing Rome's borders, which eventually they did, with disastrous results. The Germans would spend most of the 5th century running away from the Huns and asking, to put it mildly, if they could become Roman citizens. Now, the Romans, being prideful as ever, usually refused or gave the Germanic tribes deals which forced them to sell their children for old dog meat, which, unsurprisingly, did not go over well and led to attacks, invasion, and general violence, perfectly illustrated in the first sack of Rome in almost 800 years. By the time Attila dies of a nosebleed, the Germans are basically chilling in the empire, with or without the emperor's permission, and just decide to stay because the climate of the Mediterranean is much more pleasant than the gloomy forests of the north. Eventually, the Western Empire is officially ended by a Germanic general, and the Germanic successor states start to push against each other in an attempt to get some space and more of that sweet Mediterranean sun. The new kingdom, which ends up showing up all its neighbors, is the Frankish Kingdom, a place that will spend the next 1200 years trying to figure out the perfect mix of Germanic and Roman. The first step in this process is to push out all of its neighbors from Gaul and claim it for themselves, then impress the Pope by saving him from the Lombards, and just like that, the Pope crowned Charles the new Emperor, something he basically just decided he could do and which everyone at the time thought was the most Roman thing ever. I mean, what's more Roman than being crowned Emperor, am I right? Charles sees this as a good noodle sticker for his trying to convert the Saxons, a Germanic tribe that manages to get everywhere and makes naming very confusing, and decides to keep up the good work. This leads him to incorporating territories all the way to the Elbe and subjugating many others further east. 
Charles's son has some troubles keeping the empire together upon his father's death, and decides to split it among his three sons in 843, the worst trend among Germanic nobles ever. He creates the kingdoms of West Francia, Lotharingia, and East Francia. And just to make sure Lotharingia won't make it as a country, he gave the title of emperor to Lothar. Lothar's brothers wasted no time in killing him, dropping the title of emperor on some kings of Italy, and ripping his kingdom apart while fighting over exactly where the boundary between their kingdoms is for the next 1100 years. In the meantime, West Francia would splinter into so many mostly independent duchies and provinces that it can hardly be called a single country, while Vikings wreck their northern shore. East Francia, by contrast, gobbles up Italy, still trying to keep that sweet Mediterranean sun, while fighting off the Magyars. In 955, this guy Otto beats them so bad that his men just declare him emperor, a title which will remain in effect for the foreseeable future. The title of emperor is something the Pope jealously guards the right to bestow from this point forward, making going for that title almost not even worth it. First, the empire starts off made of three large components, the kingdoms of Germany, Burgundy, and Italy. The imperial prospect first has to get elected king of Germany by the German nobles, who still don't see themselves as German, but Saxon, Bavarian, Thuringian, etc. Then he has to get Burgundy and Italy on board, which usually takes an invasion or two to really sell it. Then you have to get crowned by the Pope, and if you can hold all the infinity stones, you can be the Holy Roman Emperor. This setup led to innumerable issues that prevented the empire from being a powerhouse right off the bat. The nobles of all three components were determined to guard their rights and privileges, and often put the emperor in compromising positions, or outright betraying him, to keep those. On top of that, the emperor and the pope often disagreed about who was the most important of the two, so the pope would get the nobles on board with the whole betrayal thing to make sure the resources of the empire couldn't be brought against him. And while this was going on, the Germanic nobles are doing that cool thing where they split their lands amongst their sons, leading to a patchwork of ridiculously small and politically irrelevant states that are mostly just trying to survive. This fracturing, in the long run, ends the three kingdoms as serious political forces and ends up being way worse than in West Francia because the rich Italian lands, with that sweet Mediterranean sun, are south of the largest mountains in Europe. And when the emperor goes to deal with those, the German nobles often cause trouble behind his back. While in West Francia, it's just a block of Frankish nobles that are often killed off and their land given to the king because they joined the English. And yet, despite all this trouble, the Germans still find time to go crusading both into the Holy Land and against pagans to the east, leading to a troubled relationship with the Slavs and random attacks on the Jews in 1096. Because of the western and then eastern movement of the Germans, there's a tendency of the country further west to view the country to their east as unimaginative and barbaric, which of course means they should conquer it, leading to a chain of difficulties across Europe. I've mostly focused on the area in Central Europe which holds the Kingdom of Germany, but I do want to take a second to look at the Germanic kingdoms that formed across Europe and explain the lack of a strong Germanic identity there. I mean, you can see that people who fall under the category of Germanic end up all over Europe, so why aren't there other Germanys or Austrias? Well, let's start with Italy, most of which is part of the Holy Roman Empire at this time. Italy has been the heart of the Roman Empire for a long-ass time, and still saw themselves as such long after the actual political entity was dead. Despite a host of Germanic invaders, these people either didn't integrate with the locals very well, or integrated well enough that they just became another variant of Italian. These German settlers did leave their mark in many ways, and certainly enough to help fragment the region, but not enough to make them forget their Roman roots. In North Africa, the Vandals didn't integrate well at all, were hated by the locals, and ceased to exist as a political force as soon as Belisarius arrived in the 500s. Hispania had a similar problem, where even though the Visigoths were there for a long time, as soon as the Muslims arrived, they tore down the kingdom with ease, converted most of the populace, and over the next several hundred years, erased any sense of gothic niche which might have existed. Eventually, the Germanic invaders from the mountains of northern Iberia would take the region, but they had traded their Germanic heritage for a more fervent Catholicism, which would be the single most defining factor of the region for a long time. Which leaves the tiny little island that was so useless, the Romans literally abandoned it. Two distinct Germanic tribes moved into the area, the Angles and the Saxons, who were all over the place. Together, while fighting against Celts and Vikings, they would become integrated into the Anglo-Saxons, an identity which is held to this very day. So the English do have strong ties to their Germanic roots, but they have also faced so many threats from outsiders that they quickly formed an identity unique to themselves as a way of othering everyone who wasn't already on the island. Because you know, 
they got there first. My point in going over these areas is that these tribes had no German identity and often even lacked a strong tribal one, meaning it was easier for other peoples to pull them into their cultural sphere. The German identity only really developed in an area where the Germans weren't in close proximity to another group with which they could integrate. And even then, the German identity was slow to develop. Back to Central Europe, the history of this region splinters into a wide variety of small petty states that develop their own unique identities that permeates the development of the area. Roads, castles, markets, churches, these don't develop to fit within the framework of a kingdom or even several duchies, but a vast patchwork of microstates that have different functions depending on what resource their little territory happens to be built around. These territories don't see themselves as German in any sense, or even as Holy Roman citizens. They're just Bavarians, or Lower Saxons, or residents of the Bishopric of Mainz. And these identities are mostly reserved for urban dwellers, who might just see themselves as subjects to whatever lord happens to be on the throne. Cartographers have looked with disdain at this area, and that feeling often gets translated to historians as well. But these places are adorable little views of medieval individualism, many of which still exist today as a reminder of how diverse and independent German identity really is. The environment comes to a head in the 16th century as Martin Luther tweets his 95 theses and tags the Pope. This makes all those different princes and dukes pick which religion they like the best, depending on if they want the emperor's favor, if they'd like to be more independent, or if they're just closer to Rome. A concurrent development to this is that the German nobles have decided that the Habsburgs are the least offensive royal family in the Holy Roman Empire, and they get elected to the imperial title pretty much every time now. The Habsburgs end up being so busy fighting Turks and managing the wide variety of real estate they control, with different levels of authority, that they don't really bother the other nobles until the illustrious Charles V, ruler of Spain and Austria, takes over and has to deal with the religious break that is stirring up so much trouble. He's a very busy guy and just tries to brush it off by saying everyone can keep whatever religion they have when he holds the Diet of Worms in 1521. But this solves nothing and makes everyone even more angry. Eventually, Charles gives up all his titles and leaves the German princes to slowly get more upset with each other until finally some bohemian Bohemians throw a couple of Austrians out a window, so France and Sweden invade. The Thirty Years' War was fought almost entirely in the HRE, and devastated the lands of the German princes, scarring their cultures for centuries. No one really won this war, but the principalities of the HRE and the peasants who were butchered by both sides certainly lost. This all amounted to nothing except further fragmentation and the loss of territories for the HRE, Sweden deciding it would play with the big boys, and Europeans implicitly agreeing to never fight over religion again. While people like to pretend that the HRE was a single block, at least up to the Thirty Years' War, no one can even try to make this claim after the war. All of the principalities and duchies form their own alliances, raise their own armies and taxes, and fight each other over the pettiest of disputes, with the title of emperor merely a formality. Out of the turmoil of the war comes the insecure, marginal, defenseless state of Brandenburg, which, after some negotiating with the Poles, becomes Brandenburg-Prussia. This state would end up being a major headache for everyone, but mostly Austria, who is busy trying to eat up non-German territories to compensate for their inability to govern the German lands. Brandenburg itself was weak, much like Sweden, but also like Sweden, it had a couple good rulers in a row, which allowed it to swing on the scene as a great power, snatch Silesia from Austria, then almost die at the hands of Russia, Austria, and France, saved only because a Prussophile ruler took over Russia at the last second and ended the war against them. With the death of Frederick the Great, however, the state went back to being weak and would never have a strong king again. Prussia was almost dissolved by Napoleon once he crushed their army at Jena, and was once again only saved by the Tsar of Russia, who preferred to keep it there. Napoleon also decided to clear the map of the mess that was all these tiny German states and rationalize it by giving everyone who joined him some lands of the tiny minor nobles who didn't, which worked to get basically all of Germany on his side. By this time, the Holy Roman Emperor disbanded the empire just to stick it to Napoleon, ending the Thousand Year Reich. There were a variety of coalitions that were built against Napoleon, primarily by Austria and Britain, and these German states were often forced to pick a side as it was their territories that were being fought on and over. Eventually, they all sided with Napoleon, or were swept away, then all turned on him and were further condensed, as no cartographer liked having to draw the damn place.
This is the part where people usually start talking about German nationalism, because this is the first time contemporaries start to think of it. But it's still a ways off, despite what revolutionaries in 1848 thought. However, it is important to note that this is the time when Germans start to think of uniting for their own benefit, rather than because some outside power said so. Ultimately, a united Germany would need both Prussia and Austria's consent to happen, and neither was really interested at the time. There were also still some questions about what exactly constituted Germany. Like, would the whole Austrian Empire be brought in? What about Schleswig-Holstein? The Czechs were in the German Confederation, but did they count? Eventually, people just decided that everyone in the German Confederation would be in, and they'd hammer out the details later. They offered to make the King of Prussia the leader of the new German nation, but he rejected this, worried about pissing off Russia and Austria. And the the whole movement fell apart. Then, a few years later, Otto von Bismarck decided to make a Germany on his own terms, fought a few wars, got Austria's consent in the second, and pulled all the German states into a federal union, with the exception of Austria, who had too many non-German territories to be worth taking in. What I mean by federal is that it was not the autocracy many make it out to be. There were varying degrees of independence, tax exemptions, and separate negotiation that went on amongst the many states that made up the German Empire. There can be no doubt that the Kaiser had total authority in some areas, namely foreign policy and the military, but how the different states fit into that framework varied from place to place. Germany was never a place of uniformity and militarism, and people who see Germany as especially militaristic are misled by Allied propaganda. While it certainly was a culture with a lot of respect for men in uniform, between 1871 and 1914, Germany, aside from a few colonial ventures common at the time, got into no major wars, and in fact often maneuvered to avoid them. While places like Russia would engage in at least two, France would have a higher percentage of men in uniform, and Britain would maintain a much stronger military presence across the globe. During this time, Germany would become the manufacturing hub for the world, gain the most Nobel Prizes, have the most renowned colleges in the world, and lead the world in scientific and industrial practice. Some of the best philosophers, scientists, and artists were born and raised here, and the cultural impact of their works is still with us today. In short, Germany was dominating the world before the First World War, and only that war wrecked that trend. The blame for the end of German hegemony lands squarely on the shoulders of Wilhelm II. Wilhelm did a lot to antagonize Russia and Britain, who passively let Germany unify in the 19th century, and shoved them into the arms of France, when this was completely unnecessary. He doubled down on Germany's alliance with one of the weakest powers in Europe, and did nothing to even try to diplomatically maneuver his country into a favorable position in the war, never mind out of it entirely. To be fair, there were many war hawks in Germany at the time who pushed for this, but the fact of the matter is, Wilhelm let it spiral so rapidly out of control, and in the process ruined his country's global preeminence. I could go on for hours about how catastrophic World War I was for the German Empire, but suffice to say, everything that was true for Germany before World War I would be true for the US by the end of World War II. In the First World War, Germany had to fight on two fronts and hoped that by knocking out France quickly, they could then mobilize all their resources east. Once Britain arrived, primarily due to the Germans invading Belgium, the war in the west stalled and went nowhere, while the war in the east went spectacularly for the Germans. Germany beat Russia in World War I, a fact conveniently forgotten by most of the world, but tragically not forgotten by the Nazis. The Germans made some serious advances against the Russians, pushed their political structure to the point of collapse, and made off with a mass of buffer states that were a sneak preview to Europe today. This, however, couldn't save Germany, as by this time in the West, their military structure had failed to adapt to their situation, and they were unable to make gains or utilize modern technology in a meaningful way. Despite participating in basically every single front of the war and carrying the central powers on its back, Germany wasn't able to compensate for lackluster planning and the combined might of France, Britain, and the US. The army leaders, aware of imminent failure before them, called an end to the war before Allied troops entered Germany, shirked any responsibility for the loss, and blamed the whole thing on disloyal citizens and non-Germans in the country, who stabbed them in the back. This was widely believed at the time, and created an environment of hostility after the war, which led to street fights and much confusion. The Allies, thoroughly horrified by the war, reduced Austria, a country whose whole identity was formed by oppressing non-Germans, to a rump state, neutered Germany Germany of its military and colonies, reduced its size, and stripped it of great power status. The nobles which had ruled over the strange bits of lands that dotted the countries were removed, and a full-on republic was made to the satisfaction of almost no one. 
This arrangement wasn't necessarily doomed from the start, but it was troubled and always under threat from within. Numerous coups, putches, and attempted secessions popped up across the country, which held itself together quite well before collapsing into the abyss of hyperinflation. Germans at this time were uncertain of their future, insulted by the treaty that ended the war, and unsure of who to blame. And just as they started to move past this in the 20s, the economy collapsed again, and people looked for radical solutions to what seemed to be radical problems. The history of the Germans is a long and tenuous one that can only be retroactively called German. For most of its history, it was not a united place, and even when it was united, it was riddled with exceptions and exemptions. What does it mean to be German is still a relevant question, but one that must be asked quietly because of its close association with the answers Hitler gave. This isn't a group of people who unanimously march to the beat of war drums, although that's what most outsiders would like to think. No, this is a place of severe individuality and decentralization. The Nazi structure was not as hierarchical as it looked at first glance, and the follow-up was two Germanys. Austria is still independent from Germany and barred from ever uniting with it. The country is racked with confusion and stripped of the coherent national boundaries and common practices that underpin English or French history. Germany was great, arguably the greatest, but for such a short period of time that it was hardly able to process it before they were reduced to a second-rate power, then torn in half, which makes many wonder if the whole project was even worth it. When you look at the history of the Germans, it's the story of people trying to understand why they live together, who should be part of the group, and debating if their current state is worth the suffering endured. In short, the story of Germany is the story of Europe.